Welcome to the British Library and to the realms of Ursula K. Le Guin. This event is part of the programming for our current exhibition, Fantasy, which has been a huge success. And there are only four weeks left, so get in there while you still can. Tonight's conversation celebrates a colossus of the genre and frankly, most other genres too. Ursula K. Le Guin is just one of those writers who will accompany you for a lifetime. Um, one of those writers you think you know and love and then you reread them and you love them more. One of the thrillers of our fantasy exhibition is that it features Ursula K. Le Guin's very own drawings and drafts, including a map of Earthsea. Um, and these items are on display in the UK for the very first time. But back to tonight, and here's how it works. You enjoy the combined magnificence of our panel, and then they get to answer your questions. So do please put questions in at any time. You can see the question box below the screen that you're looking at. Um, and with special thanks to our chair, Sarah Shin, who will be guiding everybody through this with our own special wizardry. Sarah Shin is a writer, editor, publisher, researcher and curator, as well as founder and director of Ignota Books and Silver Press. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, B. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm really also happy to hear um, to, that you mentioned the map, which was fantastic to see. And we'll come back to that a bit later, I think. Um, and it's been an almost inconceivable honor to publish Le Guin and to engage with her stories and her tools the metaphors that she's given us and also the alternatives. Um, so it's also a great honor to be here today to celebrate her life and work with our magnificent panel. Um, I'm gonna introduce people briefly. So we have Theo Le Guin, Theo Downs Le Guin, um, Ursula's son and literary executor, Julie Phillips, her biographer, and Nicola Griffiths, who is an award-winning writer of many books, um, among them numerous fiction, science fiction and fantasy novels. And she was also shortlisted for the 2023 Ursula K. Le Guin Prize for Fiction. So given that this event is on the occasion of the fantasy exhibition, I thought that we might begin by setting the scene with her path to writing fantasy. Um, in her afterword to The Wizard of, Ur of Ursi, she tells a story about a publisher's invitation to her to write a novel for teenagers. And initially, she says that the idea of writing for a specific audience scared her off. But she did like the idea of, quote, pure old fashioned fantasy, not mixed with science fiction. All my life, I've been reading about wizards, dragons ma and magic spells. So I'd like to start by asking Julie um, about how Le Guin got started writing and publishing fantasy. And then I'd like to invite Theo and Nicola to join in as they wish. Yeah, you know, there are so many different answers to that question of why she started writing fantasy. It might almost make more sense to ask why she wasn't writing fantasy, which I think is partly because it was very out of fashion in the 40s and 50s when she started writing. And, you know, she was extremely ambitious for her writing. I, I think that she felt that she couldn't express those ambitions within fantasy. And she was also very politically engaged right from the beginning. And I don't think that it was clear to her how to do that and write fantasy at the same time. But, you know, I think she turned to fantasy for the reason that a lot of writers and readers do, which is that the realism of her time, the realism she was trying to write, didn't have language to express her reality, to express her experience. It was extremely, you know, male-centered. Um, women's experience, women's bodies. She talks about later, she will go on to talk about Wolf and how difficult it is to write about women's bodies. And I think that there was, she found some of what she needed in fantasy. And, you know, she went through a really long process of inventing herself as a writer. And the turn to science fiction and the turn to fantasy was part, and, and the turn to children's literature was part of that ongoing process. And then, specifically, she was, you know, part one of the 
origins of Earthsea is that in the early 1960s, she got a microscope. She was thinking about writing a book on microbes for children for the same press that ended up publishing Wizard of Earthsea. And she was sitting there looking in the microscope and making drawings of these little one celled organisms. And then this thing swam into her field of vision that was much larger and had kind of paws and it looked like it was reaching towards her with its paws and it had no face. And she was terrified and, you know, part of her realized that it was a tardigrade, it was a multi-celled organism. And part of her just remembered that one primal fear of looking at that thing. And she said that that was the origin of the shadow in the Wizard of Earth. So there's a wow. kind of a, and Nicola was talking about, you were talking about fantasy arising from lived experience and arising from bodily experience. And I thought of you and that thinking of lived experience, the experience of the shadow. Yeah, I, um, for me, Honestly, for me, all fiction is embodied fiction. I can't, I can't think just with my mind. I think the mind is the body. Um, it, but but fantasy, I I think is particularly a thing of the body. Fantasy, so much fantasy is about the natural world. It's about trees and and birds and a lack of machinery. I think in most fantasies, there's a striking lack of mechanisms. Um, and I think there's a real reason for that. I think our earliest stories are about, are as simple as humanly possible. It's about a body, a human body in a place. Um, and that I think with fantasy allows you to get rid of the cultural accretions um, because you, you're looking at what's possible, what's been possible for the last quarter of a million years of, of humans being humans. I don't know if I'm making sense here, but I, I, I get the feeling that in that sense, um, Le Guin and I, to a degree come from the same place it's a, it's about it's about being it's about being in a place and feeling the world it, it's a different kind of mm -hmm. creation she was so deeply rooted in place and a lot of she said that a lot of her fiction came out of observations of places this feel and that and out of that feeling of being a body in a particular natural world. So. I also think that what looks like alternation between genre in retrospect may not have felt as much that way to her, you know, to some mm -hmm. degree. She was very interested in the, the formal difference between fantasy and science fiction, but at the same time, she spent her life erasing many of those boundaries and mm -hmm. and speaking about how little those boundaries matter to anyone except publishers mm -hmm. and if you think about some of her very early work like the story april in paris which predates her first science fiction mm -hmm. novel by a couple of years you know that that is a fantasy story in the sense that it relies on magic and the occult but the protagonist is a scientist and and he sort of acts and behaves very much in the in the empirical uh, framework. And then two years later, Rakanan's world comes out and that is clearly a science fiction novel in the sense that, um, again, a social scientist is the protagonist and there's interstellar travel, but also that protagonist gets to ride a wind steed and, um, you know, there are very elven characters. So is it, you know, which, which is fantasy and which is science fiction? It's not, not clear to me. I think so much of genre labeling is all about understanding reader expectations. I think if you label something science fiction, 
do you know what kind of reader will be reading that book? If you label it fantasy, you've got a different kind of reader. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can't speak uh, to Ursula's work. But for me, I don't deliberately, I don't think I have this story to tell. Should I tell it as fantasy? Should I tell it as science fiction? For me, I don't even begin with a story. I tend to begin with a question. And mm -hmm. so the nature of the question tends to dictate the mode I use to tell it. So uh, to give you an example, my first novel, Ammonite, um, which owes so much to the work of Ursula Le Guin and Joanna Russ. It's just, mm -hmm. you, you can't miss that if you read the book. Um, but for me, the question I wanted to answer was, are women human? Because I, I was so tired of reading stories where women were less. They were like may, men were the standard and women were this extra like girl people. Um, they weren't real people. And so I set out to answer that question. And I thought, well, the easiest way to answer that question is to build a world full of women and women identified people and get rid of the men and let the women play all the roles, fill all the cultural niches and see what happens. And I guess I could have done it as a fantasy, like a, a portal fantasy or something, but I wanted it to have a sense of threat also. And, and there's something about writing fantasy that, that there's almost like a veil between the fantasy and, and the reader's notion of the real world. They don't cross over quite as much, whereas science fiction feels just a little closer. And it's hard to explain why. I'd love to hear anyone else's thoughts on on that, if you have any. Perhaps some of it has to do with the treatment of time in the different genre, that science fiction is often kind of specifically time-based and time-constrained, even if it's out of the time that we experience when we're living, whereas fantasy is often explicitly out of time. And, um, you, you know, whether it's before or after uh, doesn't matter. And that may be the reason that I think, I don't know if this is empirically true, but my experience is more fantasy is, is written in the past tense and more in science fiction is written in the present tense, which lends a present tense lends a kind of out of time quality to the writing, even if the story itself is very time-based. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many ways that we can go from here, but I was thinking that um, Le Guin spoke broadly about a deep ingrained hostility to what she calls imaginative fiction, encompassing both science fiction and fantasy. Um, and there was an essay that she wrote um, about her previous essay called um, The Question I Get Asked the Most Often. And she was saying that one of the questions she gets asked the most often is, where do you get your ideas from? Um, and she answers saying that there's no such thing as pure invention it all starts with experience and invention is recombination um i'm quoting we can only work with what we have there are monsters and leviathans and chimeras in the human mind they are psychic facts dragons are one of the truths about us we have no other way of expressing that particular truth about us people who deny the existence of dragons are often eaten by dragons from within so thinking about dragons as a sort of avatar for this beast of imaginative fiction, the question is, are Americans still afraid of dragons? Nicola, I know that you were, you liked this question. It piqued you. Yes, I, I think um, assuming you can talk about Americans as a block, are, are Americans afraid of dragons as discrete imaginary creatures? No. Um, you just have to look at what uh, the last few decades of fiction has done with dragons. You have you have the dragons of Pern, which are benign, 
and massive, but they are created by an understandable scientific process. And more to the point, they are dependent on people. They have been created to work for people. They're essentially controlled by people. And then you've got the dragons of uh, Game of Thrones, which are mysterious and magical, but they can be tamed, or perhaps it might be better to say broken, maybe broken like horses, except horses that come with built-in artillery, built-in firepower, and um, and then used to dominate others. But dragons as facets of our inner selves that we don't want to acknowledge, or or dragons as the other, yes, um, I think Americans are frightened of the other. I think, I think, but that other now is more um, zombies and doppelgangers. They are things that look like us, but aren't us. Things that there's no reasoning with and we don't know where they come from and they're overwhelming. I think that um, one of the few statements you can make about Americans as a block is that we're afraid of a lot of things at the moment, not just dragons. But if you, you know, if you take that essay and dragons in that essay as a simple metaphor for imagination, mm -hmm. I think that there is there is fear there. We've, um, you know, the word creativity has become so denatured in the US that it's become sort of co-opted mm -hmm. as a as a general good and an adjunct to capitalism and i think imagination is is on the same path toward co-optation as a word and as a concept mm -hmm. that it's something mm -hmm. that we all accept is important and good and you should have it and schools should instill it through their stem curricula but what purpose it actually serves, I'm not sure many of us, and this is really not just a statement about Americans, many of us are, are unclear about what purpose it serves beyond being a differentiator in the job market or as a influencer or content creator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Ursula in her essay about that, the operating instructions talks about about um, the need to use imagination specifically to imagine your own life and to define yourself for yourself. Otherwise, other people will imagine. And um, Adrienne Marie Brown, who was a great admirer of Ursula's talks about um, feeling that she's in an imagination battle as a black woman in the United States, either you know, her imagination, her imagined vision of herself will prevail or other people's imagine, imaginary about black and brown people prevail. So, well, I, go ahead. And for Ursula, imagination was a, was a very, it was active. It was an act of construction. It was not daydreaming or an idle activity, which I think is how it has often been characterized. Mm -hmm. And that's quite inspiring, but it also um, it's also very close to the kind of instrumentalization of imagination that we can see as a um, as a workplace act or a, as a as a form of being a good corporate citizen. Um, you know, she she had a formidable work ethic, so it's not surprising that imagination <laughs> for her was a, a form of very pleasurable work. But mm -hmm. um, that that is parallel to the way I see imagination being used as something that you should do as as a good producer consumer. Yeah, so you should do it between this time and this time, right? Which is a way of not being afraid of the dragon. On another way of, you know, trying to tame that thing that Ursula felt was not tameable. Mm -hmm. People don't trust imagination. Um, they find it suspect, I think, because they don't know how to quantify it. They don't mm -hmm. know how to count it. Um, they don't know how to make so, it work for them. Yeah, they don't know how to co-opt it and monetize it. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, 
to 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 bring it back to capitalism it's uh so much is about the use the economic use of a thing the commercial use and imagination is not that tame so to bring this back to sarah's original question Yes, I think that is how the fear of dragons is expressed, is through the the desire to tame and control and monetize, which can look very much like an embrace of imagination and creativity, but it's an embrace within very clear guardrails and confines that serve certain interests, not always the reader's interest, let alone the writer's. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, um, fantasy here becomes a critique of the idea of reality, which should be enclosed in inverted commas, often, I think. And, um, you know, thinking about Le Guin's 2014 National Book Awards speech, mm -hmm. um, and she says something that has become a bit of a mantra, um, which is that it goes something along the lines of, you know, when we used to live in the age of the divine right of kings, that was taken as a given. Um, but things change and it's possible to change the reality that we think or are told that is given. But um, I also really liked the way that you were speaking about the imagination as active, Theo. Um, An active imagination is a Jungian term. Um, and I was interested quite early on in my reading of Le Guin in her engagement with concepts like the shadow. Um, mm -hmm. And then thinking about how um, Julie was talking about something about imagining yourself. Um, revisiting A Wizard of Earthsea to prepare for this talk, I was um, really struck by how it's not just a coming of age story or a buildings romance, but it's quite specifically a Kunstler romance. It's about the mastery of a craft um, and the art of magic, which in many ways um, it's suggestive of the art of writing. Um, so one of one part of the question is how often in the Gwyn and in other writers does fiction contain the story of writing fiction? Um, and to broaden it out for um, Julie's biography of Le Guin, which I'd love to hear more about, how often does writing contain writing about writing? Hmm. <laughs> That's a, um, you know, I think that is something that keeps coming back in Le Guin. And, you know, the physics in the dispossessed uh, partakes a little bit of the magic of words, I think. Um, and one of my favorite late stories of Ursula's is the Shobi story, which is, um, it's a science fiction story about, uh, uh, transference, instantaneous travel through time and space. And it's very much a hybrid uh, science fiction and fantasy story in that the, the spaceship is constructed like a house. It has a library and a fireplace. And they get lost. And the only way that they can come home is to sit around the hearth and tell the story of their journey until they can um, agree on what story it is that they're telling, which is a story about space travel and a story about literature and a story about family and what makes people human is so such a rich bit of metafiction about writing and the work that it does. Yes, I, I'm not sure I see wizard as as metafiction or mm -hmm. writing about writing. I do think that there is sort of a, a triangle between writing magic and morality in that book and, and the connected element is is morality that you know language uh and morality are heavily linked in ursula's oeuvre and uh morality and magic are heavily linked and magic of course is partly expressed through runes and writing and speech so in that sense they all come together but i i see it more as a, a triangle than than a two parallels i think i'm getting mixed up in my geometry now but well, there's a question about power, I think, um, and the morality and, and the power and the responsibility to use power correctly. I was wondering, Nicola, if you might be able to speak about power in relation to some of your explorations of, for example, gender or disability in your work. Mm 
I'm sorry. Can can you be more specific about that? Because I can talk about what's the actual question. Sorry, I'm a bit. Um, it was a question about power, I suppose. And um, yes, and it was a broad question. But thinking back to um, what you were saying about where you begin, which is actually beginning with a question. And one of the things that is incredibly striking about Le Guin's writing is, you know, she really distills the question or, or the thread to follow. And it seems like, you know, she builds these incredible worlds in which things unfold so that it's possible to answer that question. Um, so my question about asking questions maybe um, is about what do you think power is in, and how do you explore that through the questions that you pose? Power in relation to magic and art. Hmm. So magic as a kind of power, or I think art is power itself. So, so your question is splitting into, into this whole shooting array for me. Um, magic, writing is a kind of magic for me. It's, um, if I'm lucky, if my writing's going really well, it, it feels like a dream. It actually feels a bit like a maybe a hypnagogic state. Actually, some of the most powerful images and moments, the kind of things that I think snag a person's attention, they actually come from uh, falling into a kind of hypnagogic state, just that moment when you are falling asleep. So your conscious control of your mind is thinning and fading. And, and it allows all these kind of interesting, powerful things to come arrowing up out of the deep. And, and I used to keep these index cards in my drawer at night. Um, and I would wake up from this state and just write without turning the light on just write on these cards and sometimes in the morning they would literally be incomprehensible you could not read them and then other times they were just this lovely image that I have no idea where it came from it came from somewhere very deep or all these different kinds of experiences that come together and I think that is one of the real gifts of fantasy is that it allows it gives you permission to let go of this sort of self-protective rational control of how things should work and just explore what might be possible so so yeah in terms of writing as power as magic absolutely Nicola, I'm so I'm so glad you uh, answered the question that I would have asked if I were a viewer about whether you wrote down what you experienced in the half half asleep, half awake moment, because I think it's that's the natural question is what what do you do with that as a writer? How do you how do you use it? And the first question in order is, do you actually transcribe that? And, you know, can you wake yourself enough to make a cogent note and how do you use that later? Some thank of them, you. sorry. Oh, no, I just wanted to thank you for um, grasping the edges of my very Neptunian question. Um, but also the way that you answered it made me think of the image that begins the lathe of heaven, where there's the jellyfish floating in the ocean. Um, what were you going to say, Nicola? I, I was... Uh going to respond to Theo about about how how to bring the magic and the real world together as in how do you bring those hypnagogic images into your work and the fact is that sometimes you can't sometimes I have this whole folder of these lovely rhythmic snippets of I think it's wonderful but it, it doesn't fit anywhere I can't use it for anything they're just balloons in space but then sometimes these things it's like reading poetry uh I'm, I'm not saying what I'm writing is poetry I'm just saying it it 
functions the same way as reading poetry. So to me, it is not at all surprising that Ursula is a poet as well as a fiction writer, because there, there are some things that come from this place that you just can't use in a story. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if either Julia or Theo can respond to this, but do you think Ursula's poetry comes from the same place and is instead of story because it won't work in story would she have taken some of her what became poems and put them in a story if she could did she privilege one or the other I suppose is what I'm trying to ask hmm. at different times in her life she privileged different kinds of writing in the beginning she wanted to be a poet that was her earliest ambition um, and her earliest published work was poetry. By around the late 50s, she was starting to think of herself more as a fiction writer. And um, quite often I find her poetry in her notes, in her journals, where she's using it to, I think she is using it to record those states and just to record her daily life and her daily experience. It's really the most kind of primary and emotional part of her journeys is her poetry. And she would take things out later and re revise them actually almost not before publication. And later, I think poetry became a more focused practice for her. And particularly at the end of her life, when she said that she didn't have the energy anymore to write fiction, she was in a poetry writing group. She was only publishing poetry and did some extremely well-honed work. Her poetry is wonderful throughout my particular life of poetry. It may also have been, you know, in the 60s and 70s, partly a function of available time that she was in a uh, explosive period of writing long form fiction. And mm -hmm. that that combined with child rearing didn't perhaps leave as much time for poetry as she had at other phases in her life. But mm -hmm. my impression, and Julie, perhaps you can comment on this, is it, it wasn't really a matter of privileging one over the other, although she did, you know, given the opportunity, she would always point out that she wrote poetry first mm -hmm. and that it was a constant in her life. Um, but they, they, they seem to me to have been different uh, writing acts for her, that when there is poetry included in novels such as Always Coming Home, that was, that poetry was very specifically written for that context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when she set out to write poetry, not in the context of a novel, that was a, a different act and a different process. And at various points in her life might actually have had, uh, you know, have been done in different places with different paper <laughs> and pen, even, you know, that the that when she was composing longhand, it the poetry would not have been in the same book or pad as the novel. Yeah, I think that's true. I think her poetry is, I find a lot of her poetry in her day books, even in her early travel journals, you know, she arrives in Paris in 1951. And one of the first things she does is write poems about the beauties of Paris. So they're not very good poems, but it's clear that that's the way that she's responding to this, you know, overwhelming feeling of being in a, a strange and beautiful place. Um, I'd just like to invite the audience to think of some of your uh, think of your questions because we're at halfway and we'll have um, some time for audience Q and A at the end of our discussion. So if you drop them into the box, B will be sending them along to me. Um, I just wanted to try and draw a few threads together there where I'm thinking about dreams and um, there's a really wonderful piece by Theo um, remembering Le Guin and you describe traveling with Ursula both in life and in your dreams. And you said that you were visited by Ursula in one of your dreams and you were preparing to go to China. Um, I think that's right. 
And you said that her imagination was so complex and so expansive that it was a destination in its own right. Um, so again, thinking about places and worlds and things like this and the, the movement and the dialogue between the unconscious and the conscious in writing poetry and then also thinking about um, what she writes about in The Fisherwoman's Daughter about how you're kind of lowering yourself down on the thread of consciousness into the pool, the waters of the unconscious. But um, the question to try and refine it a bit is that this movement between the unconscious and the conscious sort of reminds me of the S-shaped line in the yin-yang um, and that this mirrors wayfaring and Le Guin was famously a student of the Tao so my question was um, what did her world building draw from the world views that she grew up with? Julie that feels like a very biographer question to me. Her world building, I mean, so much of her world building actually does, again, I keep coming back to this, come from places. She said that she would, you know, she said that she um, um, often had, um, you know, real gardens with imaginary toads and then turning Marianne Moore's phrase. Um, that although the, you know, the events of her fiction were very, were, imagined the places were often very real um the tombs of atuan was inspired by a trip to eastern oregon to the desert um and um you know always coming home is of course very deeply rooted in in and around the house in the napa valley where she spent her summers as a child um that is a very Western place. Those are both, and I think she spent a lot of time. One part of her kind of long writing apprenticeship was understanding how to write about the West, um, and you know, which was also part of real a part of the realism she'd grown up with that she didn't really have access to. Nobody was writing about California. Nobody was taking. Nobody took California seriously. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure where this is going, but those are a few sort of biographical thoughts about place. There's a wonderful thing in one of her letters where she talks about growing up in Berkeley um, and being able to, to look out from the upper windows of the house across the water to the city in white city on a hill that was San Francisco. And she said, and when I came to write about it, I called it half moon. I, I don't want to underestimate the profundity of place in Ursula's work, but I would also say that as, as a writer, it seems to me you have to start somewhere and people start in different places. Some people like to start with an outline and with plot, and that was not Ursula. And she started with place that she she had to fix that in her mind and to really work it out, uh, literally as as a map, as a picture, and um, that was what got the ball rolling in in almost all of her work. Absolutely, um, I I can see that about her work, and it's absolutely true of mine. Um, and and I. I had never really thought about the Tao in these terms, but this question, it, it makes me, hmm. If you think of uh, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao, and then relate that to the wilderness or, or the wildness that can be quantified, that could be measured, it could be boxed in and, identified that's not the true wildness either because both these things have to be experienced um it, it's it's about embodiment um and i what i know of ursula's work is that i think her fiction particularly if you look at something like wizard of Ursi, it grew more embodied with age, um, you, you just have to compare Wizard to Tehanu, and and the change is astonishing. Um, but um, 
for me, yes, it, it begins. Okay, uh, hmm, how to put this? To me, fiction is a, it's it's an emergent property. It comes from interaction. It's like friction, if you like. You, friction comes from literally the where the rubber meets the road. If you're driving a car, and I think fiction comes from the interaction of um, a character in their place. I think you have to be in a place to stand any chance of knowing anything about yourself in response to that place or your character. I mean, I actually, I don't know how, I don't know if Ursula did this. I don't know how other writers do this. But for me, the interaction of a character and their place is what builds the character and um, what they notice, how they consider what they've noticed, how they feel about what they think about what they have noticed. You can just walk a person through a forest for five minutes and you can tell if they're a lumber man. You can tell if they're a lover looking for a soft glade to meet their sweetie. You can tell if they're a child fleeing a monster just by how they what they notice and, and how they feel about it. So, yes, <laughs> definitely um, environment is, oh, it's the key, I think, to everything. Um, oh, I love, sorry, carry on, Judy. I was going to say that Ursula also had a really strong sense that comes out, particularly, I think, in the Ursi books and also in Always Coming Home of uh, what you might call the numinousness of objects, she, you know, of a strong feeling of for the sacredness of stones, of trees, you know, sometimes for the terrifying powers that might be. And um, I do think that comes out most strong. No, I think that comes through in all. One of my um, favorite quotes is um, from Ursula is that narrative is an encounter with the environment, something that comes about as we walk it. Um, and also thank you, Nicola, for um, bringing the relationality of, of language into play here, because I also do think that the magical worldview is something that is inherently relational. And of course, the oral tradition was so important to Le Guin in so many ways. Um, and the, you know, the prevalence of natural images and metaphors that express this sort of interrelationship and interdependence is so rich. Um, there's the water and the fisherwoman's daughter that we mentioned earlier, um, and then the stones that contain the mountains and always coming home. And I feel that this uh, intimacy between aspects of nature and also the mind that perceives it and co-creates the environment is really fundamental to the oral tradition, which, you know, is also part of the roots of fantasy. So myths will often be full of stories of metamorphosis and chimeras and also common speech between species, while some alphabets um, derive from trees. There's in general like this greater porosity between species and forms. So what can these roots of fantasy, these sort of intertangled roots between ecology and orality and language and poetry too, um, what might they offer us in a time when we're embracing other than human intelligences through science and technology? And Theo, I know that you have lots of thoughts on AI, so would you like to start us off? I'm not sure I have a good specific answer to that question. I mean, I wish more people were, as my mother was, um, people who had a deep, intuitive, emotional connection to their environment and to other animals and to rocks. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in her writing room right now holding one of her rocks. There are rocks all over the house. Some of them are labeled from, you know, places she traveled and some of them, I have no idea where they came from, probably a block or two away. And I, I must admit that when I was an adolescent and a young adult, I could not figure out why we had so many rocks in the house. And I thought it was a little <laughs> odd, and slightly embarrassing. And now I just can't get enough of them because, well, I, why? Because, because they, 
Mm, of course, because they're attached to my mother and my memory, but also because they speak to that deep connection to place and the way that she could bring, <clears throat> uh, she could bring wild or at least natural environments into built environments and and make them all work together. And I just I think that's quite extraordinary, and we need more of that. I'm not sure that I, answers your question at all, Sarah, but <laughs> gave it a shot. I, I'm so with you on this, Thea. We we really, really need more of the body in the world. I it is so strange to be out in the world and see everybody. They could be in a park, a gorgeous park with trees and the birds and the stream, and they're looking at their screen. They their whole interaction with the world is through this one small visual interface and for me the thing I love about writing fiction the thing I love about the kind of fiction I like to read is it, it just keeps coming back to the body the whole mm. body um it's about touch and scent and taste mm. it's about the weight of something in your hand, like whether or not it's a rock or a sword. It's about, I mean, I think so many people these days simply don't acknowledge how important the connection of the body and the mind is because so much screen work is, is about, separates all these parts. Mm -hmm. But if you just simply go stand, for example, under a tree, and breathe what will happen is that the the phytochemicals in the air will actually alter your brain chemistry and your cortisol levels will drop your pulse will slow you will be your blood will become more oxygenated you will literally see and think more clearly and i think to me the best fiction comes, and this is why fantasy, I think, is so powerful. The best fiction comes from just that body in a place. It, it it's, a, it's a way to think back to what could be possible. I think I've said this earlier, without the accretions of everything. And I think poetry functions similarly. I think poetry is one of those language forms that leaves out what's not necessary. Um, it leaves out assumptions in a particular way. Uh, I don't know if I'm being very clear here. Um, it just helps you be rather than plan. It It's a moment. It's a distillation of a moment. And I think fantasy is can do that. Judy. And inter yeah, I think interspecies communication and interspecies relationships, including human relationships with trees and with rocks, but also connections with animals are like one of the parts of Rousseau's work that I love the most. There's a part of um, She Unnames Them, which is a very short story about Eve unnaming all of the animals and trying in that way to feel closer to them. She says, and I said, um, the attraction that many of us felt, the desire to smell what one another smells, feel a rub or caress one another's scales or skin or feathers or fur, taste one another's blood or flesh keep one another warm. That attraction was now all one with the fear. And the hunter could not be told from the hunted, nor the eater from the food. This was more or less the effect I had been after. It was somewhat more powerful than I had anticipated, but I could not now in all conscience make an exception for myself. I always laugh when I get to that part and I'm always so moved by the vision of connection that comes just before. And there are so many interesting inconsistencies in what we're talking about here. I mean, Ursula yes, 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 loved yes. to travel mm -hmm. and uh, and yet she was literally always coming home. 
Mm -hmm. And she, you know, lived in and visited many places, but she was often very resistant to to new places. Hence mm -hmm. my my dream about her having a gig in China and not wanting to go, which came out of, I think, a, a conversation we had a few years mm -hmm. before she died about um, being a recipient of a prize that she had to go to Venice to collect and. I said, I would love to take you to Venice. And she she didn't want to do it. And mm -hmm. she'd been to Venice many times. But um, you know, when similarly we talked, I think that that dream about going to China came out of a conversation we had about places she'd not been in Asia and um and how she felt she didn't need to at that point in her life at least. So there's a contradiction there. There's a contradiction in someone for whom language was uh, a gift and uh, the center of her life, and yet she was capable of, um, you know, super or sublingual conversation with other species mm -hmm. like no one else I knew. So, and perhaps the the lesson there is that the contradictions are okay. You know, it's in mm -hmm. trying to reconcile them and and be one thing or the other that we lose the thread a little bit. Um. I just had a quick look at the questions from the audience and we have some really fantastic questions. So I thought that I might start um, sort of wrapping it up from me. Um, but talking about the body and place and doing, um, I have a question that my co-editor on Space Crone um, offered, which is about practice. Um, and so Maya is asking, um, how much did Le Guin sail? Because there's some pretty technical boat building in Tales of Earthsea. And we could also think about how she talks about sailing the stormy waters of publishing in steering the craft and elsewhere. So, um, and, and then also in Nicola's writing, which you've talked about already, but there's some really incredible descriptions of things from, you know, beekeeping um, to sword craft. So if, writers are told what to write what they know which you know lends itself to realism but fantasy often refers to skills and ways of seeing which are quite different from globalized uh, urban experience um how much is direct experience necessary to write about things for me mm, no not at all <laughs> actually um i because i write to find out i write to find the answers mm -hmm. and when you actually visit a place, what you're doing is you're seeing someone else's answer in a particular way. So, uh, for example, okay, if if I if I'm describing Hadrian's Wall fourteen hundred years ago, I don't want to actually go stand on Hadrian's Wall today, because Hadrian's Wall today, you can see the contrails in the air, you can smell exhaust fumes, you can hear kids binging away on their iPads in the background. And those things viscerally become embedded in the memory. It becomes set in a particular shape. Whereas if you read about it, if you lie back and imagine it while you're drinking a cup of tea on the deck and listen to birds sing, it really, it it frees me up anyway to, to imagine Hadrian's Wall in the long ago. Um, so it's a real mix of, hmm. but there again, you have to be very concrete as well. But I, I don't need to know how to weave to describe mm -hmm. it. I, I read an expert's book on weaving mm -hmm. and then I have to dismantle all that and then go look at experimental archaeology and, and what people think looms of the seventh century might look like. And then I have to imagine how do you build the tools to cut the trees to shape into the wood? And then what's the textile production? And so by the time I've done all the research, I've done all this thinking, I throw away what everyone else thinks because I've done so much work and, and the answer itself kind of emerges um and it's a lived in it's a lived in experience already because I've imagined it in a way that just going to visit it and looking and going oh yep I know how to describe Hadrian's wall I think that's I, I, a very Ursula answer 
<laughs> Nicola, I think she would agree with everything you said, that it's not necessarily necessary to stand on Hadrian's Wall to write about it. And mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, being, being accurate about actions or places that exist and not making up things that people could uh, point out that you hadn't described correctly mm -hmm. is very important. You know, that that's sort of, that's a, a, a rule within reality that one must follow even within a container of fantasy. Um, to the question of boats and sailing, I, I think Julie and I could stitch this together, but Ursula did take sailing lessons. She grew up in Berkeley, California, and she took sailing lessons on one person sail dinghies in a um, kind of estuary or, uh, or lagoon um, off the bay, very protected. And that made a big impression on her. She loved that. Um, beyond that, the only sailing I, I know of that she did was on, was on ocean liners um, to and from Europe. And, uh, but she loved being on the water and, uh, and especially on open ocean. And uh, of course it figures in many of her works. Yeah, and of course she would say that, you know, you know, what she knows, she knows, and it doesn't matter that much whether it's real. Um, um, oh, and, uh, but she did, uh, you know, speaking to what Nicola was saying, she did a lot of research for her historical fiction and all her, you know, everything that required specific knowledge. She told me that when she was writing Malafrain in one of her very early novels, she needed to know how long it would take to get somewhere on horseback. And she asked her father because when he had first come to uh, California in 1900, he was often going to places on horseback because there were no roads. So he was an early source of information. And I don't think that was entirely limited to historical fiction because I, I know for Left Hand of Darkness, for example, she she read a lot about living in very harsh and cold environments mm -hmm. that informed that writing. I, I was watching an interview from the, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago in, in which she said she was reading a lot more about harsh winter environments than she was about sex and gender when she wrote Left Hand of Darkness, which I thought was funny. Yeah, she was always a, a fan of the Antarctic explorers, Scott and Shackleton. She was really fascinated with that. And so in a funny way, that book grew out of that experience. And then, you know, the, um, the desire to explore a world without gender came about alongside that. Somehow the two that joined. Very, very choosy, though. Shackleton, not Scott. Really? Hmm. <laughs> he was a good leader. I mean, he got his people home. No, she said some pretty, pretty nice things about Scott too. I would, I suspect, at different times she had uses for for both of them mm -hmm. at different moments. I'm, I'm tempted to ask what wasn't Ursula K. Le Guin interested in because. Um, hearing about Antarctica and everything just makes me think that her reach was so broad. Um, but I was also thinking that, you know, somewhere she talks about how writing fiction for her is almost like translation, or actually it's very much like translation from one uh, language to, which is over there, to another. Um, and then, so, you know, whatever she experienced, obviously her capacious imagination tra transformed into something else. So, you know, the sailing metaphor, I'm also thinking becomes the carrier of the carrier bag theory of fiction. And, um, you know, when I asked about science and technology earlier, it's almost like I should have glossed that with Le Guin's critique of technology and science, um, what she would call the linear progressive times killing arrow mode of the techno heroic. Um, and it seems impossible to not think about the prevalence of that modality in the world right now today, and also about Le Guin's um, words about freedom and the role of writers um, too, where in the Book Awards speech that I mentioned earlier, she said that we'll need writers who can remember freedom, poets and visionaries, realists of a larger reality. So my final question is, how can writers and world builders offer a more hopeful paradigm for the world 
that doesn't reproduce the conditions in which the oppressions of so-called reality can be reproduced. Nicola, would you like to begin? Mm, I think you. I think we have to do one of the most difficult things. I think we have to forget our implicit bias. But if our bias is implicit, how do we know what biases we have? I'm thinking about so so much fantasy is set in a a kind of imaginary past. And people think that that history is what really happened, but it isn't. History is just a story and stories can change, but you have to really use your imagination to look at some of the difficult parts, not just the lovely fun parts, not just the trees and the streams, but the, the horror. I'm thinking, for example, of something like Game of Thrones today. Here's a man, he had a prodigious imagination, George Martin, and he creates a a very interesting version of uh, War of the Roses. And he can imagine dragons, he can imagine all kinds of marvelous things, and yet he could not imagine a world where women were real human beings. And to me, that's horrifying. Um, and I think fantasy offers us this opportunity to really not necessarily go back in time, but go back deep to what matters, to, to throw away the rest. Again, it just, it always for me comes back to the body, a body in a place. What can you do with that? If you throw away the institutions of, of capitalism or consumerism um, or carbon consumption, what, what can you do? What is possible? And, and so it's about forgetting all the things that we have learned. And um, while doing this very strange balancing act between remembering all the good things we have learned. It, I, it's very difficult to articulate. I'm sure if I sat down and wrote a hundred thousand words, I could I could give you a praise, but it's about the freedom to choose. It's about the freedom to not have to justify what you're about to say. It's about the freedom, um, it's kind of a bravery, I suppose. It's about being brave enough to not worry about what other people think of you. Um, I have no idea if I'm making sense at this point. In terms of, Nicola, one of the things you said is a willingness to unlearn as a writer or an artist. And Ursula sp spoke and wrote several times about the, I think she called it the artist's tre treachery of linking the creative impulse to, to violence and destructive tendencies and sadness and misery. I mean, she took Tolstoy to task for that <laughs> and also Salman Rushdie. And uh, I, I think per perhaps that would be my, my answer riffing off what you said is, um, uh, to question that that in, that impulse to sorry not the creative impulse but to to question the artist's treachery why is it that we are so often required to try to find meaning and artistic profundity in sadness misery violence and is that actually necessary does that propel us in a direction we want to go it's the easiest thing to do writing about misery is the is a very very easy way to trigger strong emotion it's very easy relatively speaking to make people feel disgust horror fear and pain it's very easy the hardest part is writing joy or taking a reader through horror and pain while giving them a reason 
to understand that there's a way to recover from it uh, without helping people mitigate that pain, without giving them basically the light at the end of the tunnel. I I, I loathe misery lit. I, I cannot pour enough scorn upon it. It's, I mean, to go back to the body, it's a very... Um, Evolutionarily speaking, there's a there's a good reason that we privilege the negative over the positive. Um, it's the fastest way to stay alive um, in in a, a rough world. But we are we are more than that. I think we need to find the good things. It's just so much harder to it. You have to. It's harder to earn uh, a reader's joy um, without getting sentimental, I think. Uh, it's, it's harder to write that clear, bone-hard reality of joy. It, it's a much more difficult task. And to paraphrase Ursula's quotation about love not just sitting there. I think hope mm -hmm. in fiction doesn't just sit there. It also has to be remade every day in ways that speak to current circumstance. So it's it's really difficult, but good work for a writer. Yeah, that's one of the wonderful things about the ending of the character of fiction is that she finds so much hope and so much kind of narrative power in our shared responsibility to each other and our, our experience of each other you know, in the most simple you know, food gathering, sleeping, eating, joined together way. Thank you so much. That seems like the perfect place to turn to some audience questions. Um, we've had some really great ones. Um, and I'd like to begin with a question from Sage, which is about style and fantasy. So in Le Guin's essay from Elfland to Poughkeepsie, she argues that style is inextricable from fantasy. For instance, she says, the style, of course, is the book. This is partly true of history, largely true of fiction, and absolutely true of fantasy. So does the panel have any thoughts on fantasy and style, and how does style and fantasy, the way the writer sees and speaks in prose, relate to place and to time? Hmm, people ask the small questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually... Um, just wrote a kind of interview essay not about this exactly, but it was about style and voice. And the thing I found interesting was that what a lot of people call style, I think of actually as voice. And I, I think mm -hmm. each piece, each book, each story has its own voice. And I think that voice is born on the first page. Um, and I think it, it, it comes from the question that you ask. Mm -hmm. And so I think perhaps it's because if, if one sees fantasy as having a particular style, perhaps it's because fantasy is asking a particular set of questions. Um, would you like to say anything to that, Julie? I don't think I could say it better than... Okay, fantastic. I mean, there's a there's a sort of related question, um, which is partly biographical to do with Ursula's reading, I suppose. Um, but the question is from Andy Sawyer, who says that, you know, Le Guin read fantasy writers like Tolkien before they became, for um, want of a better word, mass market. Um, and he says, while there are terrific fantasy writers operating now, such as Nicola, um, is there a sense that fantasy has become, to use a phrase that Theo, Theo used earlier, tamed and monetized by people who have simply imitated Tolkien in a way that Ursula did not? Hmm. I mean, From Elfland to Poughkeepsie is about that, and that was written in, what, 1973. Um, so that would, you know, certainly there's been, you know, 
you know, there has always been genre work that is derivative and genre work that is spectacularly original, just as realistic fiction has those kinds of fiction. Um, and I think that will, you know, we, I'm grateful to Ursula for belonging to the latter time. Yeah, I, I think um, every every human endeavor um, has has originals and copycats. I mean, um, there's a, a famous science fiction writer, Theodore Sturgeon, and he said, "90 percent of everything is crap." Yeah, I was thinking of Sturgeon's law too. Yeah, uh, but here's the thing: I I think he was a little optimistic. <laughs> I think the number is a little higher. <laughs> Um, and I think that's true of fantasy as, as anything else. I mean, I'm really grateful that there is such a body of kind of genre materials in fantasy for everyone to enjoy and for everyone to use. Knocking, you know, derivative. But if 90% of everything is crap, then the absolute quantity does matter because while that produces mm -hmm. more crap, that also produces more good work. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that might be my answer to the question is, um, yes, much of fantasy That's has been true. tamed and and uh, monetized in a way that is good for publishing as an industry and, and good for some individual writers. But there's also a lot more of it out there. And I think the boundaries of what we define as fantasy are somewhat more elastic. And I think mm -hmm. to the, the prior question, you know, what the fantasy style or voice is, is much more elastic as well. And that's that's all for the better. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I question the premise that there is a fantasy style. There are many fantasy styles, mm -hmm. and many more than there mm -hmm. used to be. And um uh, there's also, you know, a tremendous pressure for writers to produce series books and, you know, those kind of external and commercial pressures that I think are anathematic in many cases mm -hmm. to, to good writing because it, however good the writer is, they, they are spirit crushing. So that doesn't help, but I, I, I think I'm a little bit on the Sturgeon optimist side. I mean, that's one of the reasons that Ursula gave that speech in 2014 was in defense of originality against the pressure on writers to produce series. Um, we have a question from So Mayer um, asking about the shift in fantasy from its focus on heroically abled bodies to more recently including nuanced and active characters with aging and disabled bodies and minds, thinking of both Le Guin's later work and of yours, Nicola. Um, I, I think, I think uh, in terms of stories and, and history being a story, um, Ableism is one of the strongest and most pernicious stories out there. Mm -hmm. We all have it. And I think what it is, uh, speaking as a, a wheelchair user, it's um, my internalized ableism was viciously strong. I had no idea. So, for example, I wrote Hild, which is set 1400 years ago. And I wrote that book explicitly to put women and queer people and people of color back in history. And I got to the end and I was so pleased with myself. I thought I've really done this. The book was published. And a, a month after it was published, I realized I hadn't put a single disabled person in that book, not one. And it was just, I was appalled. I was truly shocked, but that's the power of story. Ableism is just, just one of the nastiest stories in the world, and it is so strong. I've forgotten what the actual question was. I just, oof, yes. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic answer. Um, we have time for one more question. So um, the question will be from Suki Wilson, um, who is asking, Ursula feels like this huge presence, even in her absence. How does Ursula persist in each of your lives now? <laughs> 
I'm not sure who to invite to answer this first, but I might look at Theo. <laughs> oh, how does Ursula persist in my life? I, that's a very difficult question for a son to answer about a mother, I think. Um, I, I, there's, there, it's, it's a talk about embodiment. I mean, how do you get the distance and the objectivity to answer that question? But you know, in, in pragmatic terms, it's it's my life work now to get as many people to read her books and stories and nonfiction as possible. And that's been an incredible gift that she, uh, in retrospect, teed me up for and, and left me to uh, to do this in her absence. It can be quite painful. And it, you know, the everything I do points to her not being here, which especially the first few years after she died was really, really tough. Um, but it also uh, gives great meaning to my life. I feel fortunate to be right now so engaged with her life. And so um, you know, reading her constantly and thinking about her, you know, it's a little bit like having her to keep me company, but I also miss her very deeply. Yesterday was the sixth anniversary of her death, and it was hard. Mm -hmm. You know, we have her work, we have her wonderful writing, we have the story of her life that, you know, the example that she set for us, but you know, as a living, thinking presence, in some ways she'll go on and in some ways I miss her. I, yes, um, her living, thinking presence very much is still here, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but where I am, who I am, what I do, mm -hmm. owes so much to Ursula. Um, my first novel could not have been written without The Left Hand of Darkness and without Joanna Russ and without Vonda McIntyre. And I, I often think of Ursula and Vonda together because I actually met them very close together. And in fact, when I very first met Ursula, it was in a bookshop. She was doing, um, I forget what book it was, but she was doing the usual tour mm -hmm. around the place. And I marched up to her and I said, hi. <laughs> She said, I've written a book and I could just see her go, oh, no. I said, <laughs> will you write me a blurb? I said, I, and I knew enough to not have brought the manuscript with me and mm -hmm. dumped it in her lap. She said, well, I, I only ever write um, blurb these days, first novels by women. I said, well, that's my that's me, my first novel. Mm -hmm. She said, well, and I will only um, blurb it, yeah if your agent sends it to my agent. I said, great, I have an agent. She was like, and I could just see her thinking, oh no, there's no way to get out of this one now. And I said, I said, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And so my agent sent the book to her agent and um, I actually wasn't sure that she would blurb it, but she did along with a, a note was basically, chastising me for using um, Irish names <laughs> because they were incomprehensible and unpronounceable. And I'm like, okay. So yeah, I, uh, and I, I, I think of Le Guin as, I think the last time I met her was probably um, here in Seattle and we went out for dinner and I just remember her looking at the, the, the menu and seeing all the wine and saying, do you have Jack Daniels? And I'm like, that's how I will remember that this mix of a very fine person and just very practical ways of being in the world. Thank you to all of you for sharing um, these beautiful memories. And I'm so grateful that many readers can meet Ursula to some degree through the work that you're doing. Um, so, um, you know, if it wasn't lunchtime or the morning for people on the West Coast, I would suggest that we all raise a drink to Ursula now. Um, but thank you again. And uh, we'll have a drink later, I suppose. Thanks so much to the British Library. Yeah.
Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.